Good evening, everyone. Um, I am just going to allow a couple of moments to um, ensure that everyone who is in the waiting room is able to join us um, and wait maybe just a couple of minutes for everyone who's registered or for most people who have registered to join us. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on this wonderful autumn evening um, for the webinar, Preparing Your Practice um, for the 2022 flu season. So you are joining the Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network, Natalie Simpson-Stewart and my colleague, Phil, who is supporting us with um, back and support um, today for the webinar. Um, and as I said, I'll wait just a couple of minutes, but in the meanwhile, we could do some housekeeping, if that's all good. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin with um, acknowledgement of the country. Uh, Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. Um, and we recognize their connection to the land, waters and culture, and would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and having said that, um, I would just like to touch base regarding some housekeeping, please. Um, all attendees are muted upon joining. Um, kindly, please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, that enables us all to, um, you know, enjoy the session and uh, ensure that there is no disruption to the session. Um, when it comes to question, please um, feel free to ask questions as you um, as they pop up, but ideally through the chat box. So ask the questions through the chat box. We will take. Um, the, we are going to allow um, time for question at the end. Questions at the end of the webinar, and please all um, do be mindful that the session is being recorded and questions will be anonymous to protect your privacy. Last but not the least, we will be taking attendance um, for the webinar. Um, and so kindly ensure that your name in the Zoom um, meeting or the session is as per the name that with which you registered, um, so that we are then able to send you an attendance certificate um, should you wish to claim that for any CPD points. Um, just a brief rundown of what we're doing today. Um, I'm sorry if I haven't introduced myself. Um, so my name is Sadia Khan. I am the Workforce Development Program Officer at the Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network. And my lovely colleague, Natalie, um, who is a practice nurse at Summit Hill Medical Practice, is um, giving us uh, a webinar on preparing your practice for the flu season, um, the 2022 flu season. And awesome, Natalie has been a nurse for over 15 years and a practice nurse for just a little over seven years. Um, and Natalie has worked over a variety of settings, including um, GP practices, um, defense and um, community settings. So it has a lot of um, zeal and zest for, you know, everything prevention and um, having a practice up to speed when it comes to things like vaccination and audit and resources and so on and so forth. So I have no doubt that we will all learn a lot from her today. Um, I will stop my rambling here and I will um, hand the session over to Natalie. Um, so Natalie, it's all to you now. I will Perfect. Thanks, Thanks so this. much, Sadia. Not Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to not talking about COVID and let's talk about something else instead. Let me open up my presentation and then we can get started. If you've got any questions as we go through, just pop them into the chat box and I'll try and answer them as we go. So influenza vaccinations 2022. So I thought we'd just start off with a bit of a refresher about what flu vaccination or what flu is. So nasty viral illness, not as bad as COVID, but still not great. On average, each year, about 10% of the population will be infected, but it tends to hit sort of close contacts and um, older and younger people a bit more. So up to 30 to 50% of children. Illness can vary widely. So you have people that just breeze through completely asymptomatic. Then you have the really awful and tragic circumstances where it leads to multi-organ failure and death. 
generally speaking, will cause a respiratory illness with some systemic features. So why should we vaccinate? So looking at statistics, it causes about 100 deaths and just over 5,000 hospitalizations in Australia each year. However, if we look at the mathematical modelling, we actually estimate that the mortality rates are closer to 1,500 to 3,000 that influenza has played a part in. The complications that can arise from moderate to severe influenza infections. So pneumonia, mostly secondary bacterial, but occasionally primary viral. Cardiovascular complications, including myocarditis and pericarditis. So all those people that were freaking out about mRNA vaccines should also freak out about influenza. Can cause encephalitis and or encephalopathy. And for pregnant people, there is an increased risk of miscarriage and stillbirth with influenza infections. Some really interesting research came out about three years ago, which actually looked at rates of myocardial infarction in people aged 50 to 64. And what they found was people with underlying heart disease in this age group, those that had had an influenza vaccination had a 50% reduction in risk of having a myocardial infarction that year. So probably related to the um, widespread inflammation, but it, it does reduce risk of heart attack in that age group, which is pretty amazing. For those of us that just get the nasty respiratory illness, it's still pretty awful. You're likely to be off work for five to eight days with symptoms and they're not fun symptoms. Post-viral cough is obviously really annoying and really embarrassing in this post-COVID world. Obviously, increased pressure and costs on the healthcare system. All of us working in primary care, flu season is a thing and we all feel it. A lot of work for us. Obviously, then leading on to loss of workforce productivity, both through people being unwell and also through caring responsibilities for family members. So I thought we'd just have a bit of a brief run through things that you might come across um, when we talk about flu vaccinations with clients and patients. So my favourite, oh no, my second favourite one. So the flu vaccine doesn't even work. Okay, nothing is perfect. No vaccine is excellent 100% coverage. There are things that we know influence the efficacy of the flu vaccine. So age and health of the individual. Obviously, the older we get, immune system doesn't work quite so well. So there is a diminished immune response. Likewise, people with immunocompromise don't get as great an immune response how well the vaccine matches the circulating strains each year. So we, the decision is made in September, October of the previous year of what strains will be included in the Southern Hemisphere flu vaccination. So we're having to make that call quite early on. Um, and depending on what happens as that flu travels down to Southern Hemisphere, there may be a degree of antigenic drift that we didn't expect. That means that the flu vaccine is not a great match. Also the level and severity of viral activity, which I will touch on a little bit later. So flu vaccination, on average, depending on how well it's matched for a year, it's expected to reduce the risk of illness by about 50 to 60%. So still reasonably good. I always like to say it's one of our least, least effective vaccines, but 50 to 60% reduction is still pretty great for our least effective vaccines. Takes about two weeks for sufficient protection to be reached post immunization. So if people do come across flu prior to that two weeks, chances are they're going to get unwell. Remembering too, we, we would love to aim to prevent disease, but what we're really aiming for is to reduce morbidity and definitely mortality with the vaccine. So might still get flu, but did you die? Doesn't protect against other respiratory illnesses. So common cold, respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza, all of those. Flu vaccine is not going to do anything of it. People will think they have the flu when they've just got a cold. We know that people who have the vaccination are 30 to 60% less likely to have a illness that requires medical attention. So they're more likely to just suffer at home with their Panadol and their tissues, not taking up time with the GP, not taking up space in hospitals. The next question, I don't need the flu vaccine, I never get the flu. Aren't you lucky to have a robust, healthy immune system? That's wonderful. You know who doesn't? Young people, infants, people who are immunocompromised and older people, particularly people in aged care, because they get the double whammy of being older, 
people and also being in an environment close to people that are not related to, which we know is an increased risk for influenza infection. And they don't do well. The other thing that is a bit interesting, so when we talk about the flu changing from season to season, so when we have little changes in the surface proteins, we call that antigenic drift. When we have really significant changes in those proteins, it's called antigenic shift. What happens when we have antigenic shift is what well, we, we end up having a pandemic year. So back in 2009 was avian influenza. So if we look at the median age of cases in pandemic year 2009, the median age of flu infections was 21. The medium the median age of people that ended up in ICU was 40. So just because you're younger doesn't mean that the flu isn't going to affect you in a serious way. The flu vaccine gave me the flu. This is my favourite question. So none of the vaccines that we use in Australia are live vaccines. They are all inactivated. There is a live flu vaccine that's used in the UK and the US. It's an intranasal vaccine, but it's not being rolled out here. The flu vaccine doesn't contain the whole virus. It contains fragments from the outside of the protein to provoke our immune system to make antibodies. Because it doesn't contain the whole virus, it cannot replicate and it cannot cause disease. It can cause mild flu-like symptoms because we are provoking your immune response. A lot of the symptoms we experience with influenza in terms of fevers, runny nose, cough, is your own body's reaction of trying to kill this virus. So by creating antibodies, by flagging to your immune system that something is afoot, you are going to provoke those symptoms. However, generally they're short-lived, reasonably mild and relieved with simple analgesia for most people. Why should I get my child vaccinated against the flu? Children in germ factories, I have two of them. I love them, but they bring home disease they're much more likely to get flu in any given season. So about 20 to 50% compared to, you know, 10 to 30 in adults. During a pandemic year, so those years where there's antigenic shift, up to 70% of children will be infected with the virus. Interestingly in Australia, so children under five are hospitalised with flu more than any other vaccine preventable disease. We don't vaccinate as much. It's a respiratory virus, which are notoriously difficult to protect ourselves with anyway. It's not an area that's well serviced by the immune system. Unfortunately, in these children who end up hospitalized, 10% of them will end up in ICU. Children are also more likely to develop complications from, from influenza. So more likely to end up with pneumonia. Even when it's illness that can be managed at home, they generally will have higher fevers, which obviously increases the risk of febrile convulsions. And because of the eustachian tube being a little bit more horizontal in children, they're more likely to end up with middle ear infections as a result of influenza. And that's painful, you know, especially until it bursts. The other great thing about children is that they will shed virus for a lot longer than we will. So they can actually pass that virus on for up to two weeks after they become asymptomatic. So that germ just keeps on going. So now we know why, how do we get ready? So what we're expecting for this year, so historically low levels of influenza the last two years, COVID-19 protection was also protection against flu. Masks are great, lockdowns, not great, but effective. Social distancing also really good. There was a significant reduction in international travel. So in terms of flu being brought in from Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere, that had a significant reduction. We also had a change in the way that we managed respiratory presentation. So when we look at monitoring influenza infections, part of it is done through laboratory statistics, part of it is done through hospital presentations, part of it is done through GP presentations. Obviously, all of those things were disrupted um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, the other thing too is we just were so swamped with testing for COVID that the, the testing we were doing for influenza really backed right off, which I'll show you on the slide shortly. So typically, peak influenza season is between June and September. So we are predicting a slightly different time frame this year, increasing international travel, we're relaxing public health measures, any residual immunity most of us had is now well and truly gone. The other challenging thing we'll have this year is that people who usually wouldn't have had vaccines recently have now had a lot of vaccines in a short space of time. And there is going to be a significant amount of you know, jab fatigue 
for want of a better term. So it's going to be a little bit more challenging to encourage people to get their flu shots this year. So when I talk about historically low levels of influenza, what am I talking about? So this chart from the Immunisation Coalition, whose website's well worth a look, um, if we look at the two large graphs, we can see that we were getting sort of up to 100,000 at that point. And I think that was 2017 and 2019. Yeah, so you can see. The interesting thing you'll notice about both of those is the predominant strain was an H3N2 influenza A. Now, this is the one that doesn't tend to produce as much protection with the influenza vaccine. So it isn't only reliant on a good match, it's also the fact that that particular strain is very difficult to get a really high immune response to. So in years where H3N2 is the predominant strain, we do tend to see bigger flu seasons. If you look for 2020 and 2021, we didn't get off the baseline. So we were just ticking along that bottom line, which is phenomenal. It, it's just an incredible statistic. In terms of the current stats, that little red line at the start, that's where we're at so far this year. So what are we going to need for flu season? Obviously flu vaccines, One Link has cracked open their beautiful website for online ordering, which is wonderful, but that's not the be all and end all. So we're going to need needles and sharps containers, making sure you have sufficient adrenaline supply and that it's all in date. Personal protective equipment. I should have included a photo of my 2020 flu season, which was me wearing an N95 mask, goggles, a gown and a cap. Um, did stop me eating Easter eggs at the front desk, which was pretty great. But this year, probably low key, you're going to need your masks and goggles. If you're doing off-site clinics, make sure you're including that equipment in your audit. So your thermometers, um, your special vaccine fridges, if you have them, making sure your SGs, sufficient cold supplies. Staffing. In your clinic, how are you running your, your flu vaccination season? Are you going to just opportunistically, a patient's in the building, do you want a flu shot? Yep, yep. Or are you going to be running clinics to try and get those big numbers through? Remembering too, flu vaccine season is a really good season to catch up on those other age appropriate vaccines that people might have missed, particularly over the last two years where we know face-to-face -face presentations have found. COVID-19 vaccines can all be administered at the same time as the flu shot, um, just in a different site. So, op pardon me, opposing deltoids. Pneumococcal, shingles vaccinations. In theory, shingles vaccination, so Zostavax with flu, absolutely fine. Shingrix, there's not a huge amount of research about um, safety and efficacy. So technically, yes. But if you can separate it, separate it out by a week, that's not a bad idea. So cold chain, most important part of vaccines, a little refresher. Now the problem with flu season is you have people coming and opening your fridge door all the time. You have a huge amount of increased stocks to keep cold. So the chances of a cold chain breach are much, much higher. Cold chain has been breached if it drops below two degrees for any length of time. Most vaccines, once they hit zero, are now no longer effective and will need to be discarded after you've spoken with the Department of Health. There is a bit more buffer in terms of going over eight degrees. So generally, as long as it's under 15 minutes, it's not considered to be a cold chain breach as long as it stays under 12 degrees. Longer than 15 minutes, get in contact with the Department of Health. Often they will tell you not to discard your vaccines, it just shortens the expiry. The other thing to remember about cold chain breaches is they are cumulative. So if you have vaccines that have already been breached once, you want to try and use those ones as quickly as possible if allowed, because if they have another breach, it's then doubled on, which is then going to shorten it again. Ideally, you're gonna not have a breach at all. The main thing to remember is everyone that who comes into contact with the vaccines is responsible for maintaining that cold chain. So I'd like you to have a bit of a think, how do vaccines flow from the moment they walk in that door of your clinic, who is handling those vaccines? Making sure your reception staff know about the cold chain, making sure that they're coming down and being given to an appropriate person and that they're being transferred to the fridge within a timely manner to maintain that cold chain. So if you look in the Strive for Five booklet at the back in under Appendix 2, there is a vaccine storage self audit. And what this really is looking at is where are the potential 
issues going to lie. So it asks you to consider staff training, making sure your equipment's purpose, has there been any breaches or any issues identified up until now that maybe haven't been resolved? So staff training, I generally like to do a bit of a refresher every year with my staff. Um, just, you know, it's not something they do all the time. So making sure they know how to check high, low temperature, doing the twice daily checking, what the responsibilities are, why it's important to bring that cold chain down, particularly if you have new staff um, over the pandemic. When you're doing your protocols, who are your key staff? So generally speaking, it's going to be the nurse that's in charge of cold chain management. In this time of COVID, if you're furloughed for seven days, who's then that backup person? Is that backup person there the same days that you were there? Are there days when no one's there that's going to be responsible? So making sure that your protocols are leave proof, basically. Making sure your equipment's fit for purpose. So now's a really good time replacing your batteries in your thermometers as you need to, or your data loggers, slush testing your thermometers, which there are some instructions in the Strive for Five guidelines. So particularly if you're using offsite um, thermometers, making sure that they're good to go and ensuring that your breach protocols are up to date. So make sure it's in line with the most current recommendations in Strive for Five and whoever's identifying that breach can follow those steps. All right, we're prepped, we've got our equipment, we know we're going to answer all those arguments, let's go vaccinate. So, in 2022, we actually have two types of vaccines. So we have the traditional old school egg-based influenza vaccines, and now we have the lovely new cell-based influenza vaccines, which not mRNA technology, but same sort of thing, giant bat full of well, canine cells, I think, for flu. Um, and rather than using eggs to produce large amounts of antigen, it's off dog cells. So there's two new strains this year. So we have a new influenza A strain, so the Darwin, the H3N2. And we also have the Victoria lineage B, that's now Austria. So looking down the bottom, these are the flu vaccines that have been registered by the TTA for this year. So two things I would like to point out. So flu cell vax is the cell-based influenza vaccine. I think the recommended retail price is around $60 to $70. Um, it's not funded on the NIP. In terms of why you would choose this. So as far as sequirus are concerned, um, it's new, it's whiz bang, it's wonderful. It's great for people with egg allergies. And it is all those things. Um, thing to remember, people with egg allergies can safely have an egg-based influenza vaccine. The amount of microalbumin, and it is minuscule to almost negligible. Um, rates of anaphylaxis, not higher with flu shot in people with egg allergy. In terms of the cell-based influenza vaccine, we don't have any evidence to say it is more efficacious than the egg-based vaccine. There is some science, if you wanna get into the really nitty gritties, um, when we're doing eggs based vaccines, occasionally in the replication and the creation of antigen process, there can be a little bit of change and a little bit of a drift in the antigen. And sometimes the virus that we get out isn't the exact same virus that we put in. It's not a huge shift. It's not a completely different influenza virus, but there can be minuscule changes. That seems to be reduced in the cell based flu vaccines but it doesn't seem to have an impact on how efficacious it is. So just in case some of you ask, that's why, um, but you, there's, there's not enough evidence to recommend one over the other, but it comes down to patient preference. The other thing is we have two of the, what we call high dose flu vaccines. So it provokes a bigger immune response. So I think we're all familiar with Fluad Quad from last year, and that is the one that's listed on the NIP this year for 65 plus. And it's what we call a added, uh, a higher dose. So there is more antigen in it. The other one that is available is a flu zone high dose quad, um, which was on the NIP a couple of years ago. The interesting thing about this is that age that that is indicated for is now down to 60 years. So for your patients who may have the option to purchase one privately, if they're not going on an, uh, having an NIP vaccine, they may choose if they would like to, have a high dose so they can choose to um, get a flu zone high dose on script if they would like to have a high dose. Um, so that's the vaccines. Who are we vaccinating? Everybody, everyone, all the time, as long as they're six months of age and over, let's jab, jab, jab. 
So who are we particularly targeting for vaccination? There are reasons we target particular groups. So first one, obvious one, they're at increased risk of complications. So they have underlying medical conditions, they're pregnant, they're a child under five. The other thing that we might strongly recommend is that there's an increased risk of transmission and disruption of service. And I bet we all know what service disruption feels like now after COVID. So we're looking at our healthcare workers, essential workers, um, including people experiencing homelessness, there is an increased rate of transmission. The other interesting one that we rec strongly recommend vaccination in is there's a risk of co-infection and mutation. And this is in poultry and pork industry workers. The theory behind this is if we have one of those nasty flus that is transmitted through animals that decides that, oh yeah, I like humans, they're great, jumps into a human, they're also co-infected with the current flu, uh, flu infection that's going around at the moment, those two viruses can then mutate, combine, create a lovely new one. Um, swine flu, avian influenza, neither of us want to repeat of those. So, NIP funding groups, while we recommend it for everyone, we can't afford to, well, in theory, we can't afford to fund a flu vaccination for everyone. So the criteria, so children that are six months of age up until they turn five, they are government funded. Thing to remember is in children under nine, in the first year that they're having a flu vaccination, they require two doses four weeks apart. Rationale behind this is the immune response in kids under nine isn't really whiz bang with the first one. So for protection in their first year, they need a second dose at that one month follow up to really push those antibody levels higher. Adults 65 and over, as I said, they're having flu ad quad on the NIP this year. Pregnant people at any stage of pregnancy. So reason is pregnant women that slight immunocompromised during pregnancy does increase their risk of complications. It is also linked with a higher rate of stillbirth and miscarriage and premature birth. If you have pregnant women and pregnant people, if they had a vaccine prior to falling pregnant in the same season, we revaccinate during pregnancy. Likewise, if they had the 2021 formula earlier in their pregnancy, we would still encourage them to have the 2022 formula before they deliver if there is time. People who identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander for six months and over, government funded. Now, specific underlying medical conditions. It's reasonably restrictive. It depends how flexible you'd like to be. So heart disease, we're not just giving it to anyone that's got high blood pressure and high cholesterol, it's not a criteria. What we're looking at is congenital heart disease that causes reduction in oxygen saturation. Uh, people with congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease. So this obviously includes people that have a previous history of um, STEMIs, non-STEMIs, um, even if they are at target with their treatment. Chronic respiratory conditions. So the really obvious ones, COPD, emphysema, bronchiectasis, um, suppurative lung disease, cystic fibrosis. The criteria for severe asthma is considered to be that they require multiple medications. So Realistically, if they're on a preventer and a reliever, they're on med multiple medications. The other thing is if they have required hospitalisation for their asthma. So you might have someone who isn't particularly well controlled. Maybe they're only taking their Ventolin, they just don't take their preventer. However, their asthma has put them in hospital, we're going to give them a government funded flu shot and hopefully nag them about their preventer at the same time. Neurological conditions, so seizure disorders, so your epilepsy, motor neurone disease, neuromuscular injuries, spinal cord injuries, all of those things are going to pop them at an increased risk of with flu. In immunocompromised, so whether that's due to disease or treatment, um, if we've whipped out their spleen or it just doesn't work very well, if they have HIV, um, I think the big thing to remember here is a lot of the medications for um, things like rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis. So looking at patients that are on their disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, um, things like Humira. Diabetes and other metabolic disorders. Now, when we're talking about chronic metabolic disorder, we're not really talking about thyroid dysfunction here. We're really talking about sort of weird protein deficiencies and a few other things. Immunization handbook does go through these in a lot more detail. So it is worth having a little bit of a look. Renal disease chronic renal failure, and we're talking sort of moderate to severe, so EGFR under 60 consistently. 
hematological disorders. So anything that affects hemoglobin. So this is your sickle cell disease, your thalassemias fall in this category. And any children that are on long-term aspirin therapy between five and 10 years of age. So reason for this is children, generally speaking, shouldn't have aspirin, not recommended for small people. Um, what can sometimes happen is if children have a viral infection and they're taking aspirin, it can cause syndrome we call Ray syndrome, and this can cause liver failure and encephalopathy. So it's not a small deal, it's a rather big deal. Um, generally, I usually, you know, you won't find many of these kids around, but just being mindful that they are there. So there's four vaccines on the NIP this year. So fluad quad for the 65 and overs, a fluria quad, which can be used from five years to 65, and vaxi grip tetra and fluorix, which is fine for six months of age and up. So at the moment, I don't think that they're issuing a fluria quad just yet. Um, I've seen vaxi grip tetra and I've seen fluorix tetra in my own fridge. Um, generally speaking, once a fluria quad starts getting delivered, really try and prioritize your vaccine grip tetra and your fluorix tetra for your under fives. There has been issues in the past where supplies become limited. Um, so if we can try and get that O'Fluria quad into the five and overs, um, just so that we're not running out of vaccine for those under fives. So moving on, we know who we wanna give vaccines to, how are we gonna recall them? Now, recall is great. Recall is time consuming. Recall takes a lot of labor to do. So really, it should be part of your overall system. It shouldn't be the be all and end all. So obviously, getting all your staff on board, making sure your doctors are promoting it, making sure your receptionists are asking, oh, do we need to book you in for your flu shot? Put your big stickers up, your big posters up, getting people to remind patients opportunistically during consultation. Posters in waiting rooms, the parent room, toilets, everywhere. I've got you know, tiny little viruses stuck all over my clinic at the moment. And, you know, we're starting to see those people booking in. If you have Top Bar installed on your computers, there is an app in Top Bar, which is flu. Um, and what it does is it flags for patients that haven't had a flu shot that year. If you click on it, drop down, it'll say, it'll show whether or not they're actually NIP funded or not, which is really helpful for those phone calls you get about, is this person government funded? So the other thing we can do is we can use PenCat to try and find our eligible groups. So there's two options. First thing to remember is that you need to make sure your coding is correct. If things aren't coded correctly in patient histories, PenCat can't find them. So in terms of best practice, if you go into your Windows menu, you look under best practice software, you'll see right, you have your little rainbow finch and then underneath there's a little orange and black finch, which is best practice utilities. If you click on that, it will bring you to this window on the left. And what you're looking for is the paintbrush where it says clean up history, which will then take you to the window on the right. And what you can see on the left hand side is all the past history items that have been free handed. Um, what we then want to do, if you select one on the left, you can then link it with a coded condition on the right. So you'll see about 28 million different variations of diabetes. Coding them all correctly as diabetes means PenCat can find those patients for you. On Medical Director, logging into Windows menu under Medical Director, go to where it says Maintenance. On the left-hand side, there's a section where it says Medical Director Clinical, and you're looking for the Diagnosis Coder. And same thing on the right, find your free hand, link it. Although I don't know what you'd link big night with the boys under, I don't know, alcohol dependence. So option one, you've done your coding, we're going to use the PenCat built-in report. So the, the good things about doing it this way, it's really quick and easy to identify the NIP patients. There's really easy visibility over how many vaccines you might need to order this season. Downsides, it's not really a sensitive filter. So it does include conditions not covered in a, under the NIP, such as vitamin D, vitamin B12 deficiency, hyperlipidemia. So how I get around this. So in your PenCat, you find your um, most recent data collection, filter it by your active patients or not, depending on how many patients you look after. If you then come down underneath where it says immunizations, you can see it goes to influenza and then you can go patient groups. So you have three bars. So one is strongly recommended and covered by 
pardon me, the NIP. The middle bar is strongly recommended but not covered by NIP. And this is people who are alcohol dependent, people with Down syndrome, people who have a BMI of over 30 fit in this category. Really strong, you're still quite highly recommended to have a flu shot, NIP won't cover you. The arts group is recommended but not, not covered by the NIP and that's everybody else. So all of your patients are in these bars. So if we're looking for NIP patients, if you select your strongly recommended and covered by NIP and you hit export, it will then give you this, except a not de-identified one. So it'll have all your patient names. What I then do is up the top, you'll see a little old school floppy disk. If you click on that and save it as an Excel file, when you open it as Excel, you can then highlight. So in my spreadsheet, it's column M. You can then go up to the top where it says sort and filter and filter that alphabetically from A to Z. And what that will do, it will then group all those diseases. So you can go through, so we can see we've got some B12 deficiencies, we've got some basal cell carcinomas, they're not going to be funded by NIP. We can then take those patients out of that if we don't want to recall patients. However, we can also see our beta thalassemias, things like bowel cancer that are included. So the other option is targeted filtering. So the good thing about this is when you have a particular group that you really want to nail down. So it might be if you have diabetic educator coming in, identifying those diabetic patients so you can make reduce their visits. You might want to target your QI as part of um, groups as part of your PIP. You can identify specific vaccine requirements. So you're over 65. If you want to do an over 65 clinics, we can recall those patients. Your kids, if you want to run a pediatric clinic or you want to allow more time, we can recall those patients. You can also use it to filter your particular group. So asthmatics, we know that for them to be NIP funded, they need to be on multiple medications. You wouldn't want to be doing this for all your groups. That's just going to take you a lot of time. Don't do that. So we come up, we find our data that we've pulled, we're going to select. So in this example, I'm limiting by age 65. So under age, I put the start age of 65. I calculate, I'm looking for my active patients. What it will tell me is how many patients I vaccinated in the previous 15 months, how many I vaccinated the year prior to that, and how many of them have never had a flu shot. So next I'm looking for my people with diabetes. So I'm going under conditions, I'm clicking yes to all my diabetics, recalculating, same graph below. Under here, finding all my pregnant women, how many of them are vaccinated? This is not a good statistic, I will improve on this, but it shows. Under your medication, so we're wanting to find those asthmatics. So like we looked for diabetes, you're going to go conditions, you're going to select asthma, then you're going to come to medications and you can choose your preventers, so your ICS and non-steroidals or your ICS larvas. Now, if you click both of those boxes, it will look for patients that are on both of those medications. So you do need to do one at a time. If you want to start with one, when you then go to, so if we're starting with ICS and non-steroidals, so we're clicking that, we're pulling that data, exporting that file. When you then go to you look at your ICS larvas, you would select no under preventers for ICS and non-steroidal so that you're not pulling the same patients for the next group. Okay, so we know who we're pulling, we've recalled vaccine administration. I am not going to go through this. You've had enough of my voice, I'm sure, but Health Pathways has a beautiful how to from the moment your patient walks into your room right until they leave it. It has all of the steps that you can do. So if this is your first year of doing flu vaccines, I'd suggest you have a little bit of a read, making yourself feel a bit more confident, a bit more savvy about what you need to be focusing on. So post immunization reactions. So big things, what's a vasovagal, what's anaphylaxis? Because realistically, they're both terrifying. So Anaphylaxis usually occurs within 15 minutes, but can take up to a few hours. This is why we do our observation time. Respiratory wise, they will have a cough. They can have a wheeze or a strider. So that real <gasps> noise might sound a bit hoarse when they're talking. Signs of respiratory distress, particularly in children. So they're tachypneic. They might be looking a bit blue around the edges, particularly on kids looking at that rib recession or that tracheal tug. Tacky. Weak carotid pulse, low blood pressure, there's sustained no improvement without treatment. Um, they may lose consciousness and there's no improvement once they're lying down. 
sometimes can get some skin itchiness, redness, um, urticarious, those big red blotches, um, and some angioedema. Not as common though. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, and I've, pardon me, I've got this around the wrong way down the bottom. So anaphylaxis should be sense of severe anxiety or distress. And the, the typically description is sense of impending doom. Like that patient is sitting there going, oh, something's very not right. And that's usually pretty much right before it all goes down. Fainting, usually with min if, within minutes, if not during the vaccination, it's very quick. Um, you can usually pick them when they walk in. They're already looking a bit pale and clammy when they walk through the door. Their breathing may be normal. It may be a little bit quick, but it's not laboured. We're not seeing that real effort to breathe like we do with anaphylaxis. Their heart rate may have slowed. Their peripheral pulses may be a bit weak or thready, but their carotid pulse is still really strong. Might have low blood pressure, but generally speaking, once you lie them down, put their feet in the air, they will improve. Um, loss of consciousness. We try and avoid it, but it happens. They will look pale. They'll look cool and clammy. They look unwell. Um, might have some nausea, occasionally some vomiting, and just feeling a bit giddy and lightheaded beforehand. My big thing is if it's not someone that I've vaccinated before, I'll say, I'll usually ask them, how are you with needles? And that way, if they're like, eh, not great, you know, you can pop them lying down or put them in a position where if they are going to go, you can get them to that supine position early. We would like to avoid people falling and hurting themselves if we can. So managing anaphylaxis. So your person sitting there, they've had their sense of impending doom and now they're feeling really tight in the chest. They're feeling a bit itchy around the throat and you're like, oh, this is not good. If they're unconscious, put them in the lateral position. Go back to your DRABCD. If they're not, I'm on the side. If the person's conscious, generally we will try and lie them down with their feet elevated just to try and maintain that blood around the important bits of the body. But if they're finding that that's making breathing more difficult, just in a position that's comfortable, but not sitting upright. We're going to give adrenaline by intramuscular injection if there's any signs of anaphylaxis, particularly if there's respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms or signs. If in doubt, give adrenaline. It's perfectly okay if you give someone adrenaline that's not having an anaphylactic reaction. Much better to treat it if it is, if you're really unsure. Remembering your dose is 0 0.01 milligrams per 10 kilos of body weight. So making sure that on your anaphylaxis kit or your rescue cart, you have your dosages stuck on there. That's part of your accreditation. Call for assistance, stay with the patient. Just yelling is good. If oxygen is available, administer it by, flow, uh, by face mask 12, 15 litres a minute. Remembering that that person, their body is shutting down all their peripheral circulation. We want to try and get as much oxygen on board as possible. Generally, you're going to give adrenaline every five minutes until they either get better or that ambulance arrives. Just keep going. Just remember to note it down somewhere. Checking their breathing. So D-R-A-B-C-D. So if absent, do your BLS, do your CPR as required. All episodes of anaphylaxis must go to hospital for monitoring. What can happen is that the reaction lasts longer than your adrenaline does. Generally, they will need at least four hours of monitoring minimum, if not overnight. The other thing that can happen is some people get better, anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis resolves, and then within a couple of hours, it comes back. So even if they feel fine, they've had anaphylaxis before, they feel great, nope they are going to hospital. Fully document, notes, 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 protect your backsides, medical legally, all of the things, including when you gave adrenaline. Okay, again, health pathways, so beautiful. They give us a lovely little rundown of how we manage anaphylaxis. Again, if it's your first year or it's been a while or you haven't had to treat anaphylaxis, have a bit of a run through, get yourself up to speed. Fingers crossed, it'll be completely useless, but better to be prepared. So key points, making sure your staff, processes, equipment are all flu season ready. So running through how your vaccines are flowing through your clinic. Does everyone know their role? Is everyone on board? Is there a secret anti-vaxxer in your midst? Identify your key groups for vaccination and who you need to recall. You will have those people who have been asking you for weeks on end since they had their COVID booster. When's flu? Can I get my flu shot yet? Is the flu season open? Those people you don't need to recall. Generally, what I do is patients that have asked me to recall them, I will do them first, and then I'll wait till that first wave of flu vaccines has gone through, and then I will pull more data 
put it into PenCat and see who still hasn't come in. Your recommendations are important, particularly when it comes to parents. The number one factor in why parents choose to vaccinate their children against influenza vaccine is the recommendation of health professionals. We don't want anyone to end up in hospital. Ideally, we don't want anyone to end up with flu. I think flu vaccines have sort of been the little brother that people don't tend to focus on. I noticed even myself, I tend to be less firm in recommending flu vaccines as I do others. And that's my failing that I need to work on. But it is one of those things that if people ask me, my recommendation is always much better to get it. You know, seatbelts, not perfect, still wear them. COVID vaccines, not perfect, still have them. Flu vaccines, not perfect, still important. So have faith, make sure you are up to speed and you feel confident in answering questions about flu vaccines so that when people ask, you know where you're at with things. So I've included some resources. So obviously the immunisation handbook, Bible number one, when all things immunisation related. Drive to five, Bible number two, all things fridge related. Melbourne Vaccine Education Centre have a really great little video that I haven't included tonight just in space of time, um, but it's really good. I think just even for non-clinical staff, just to watch, it goes for three and a half minutes. It's a really cute little cartoon, but just to give them an idea of why it's important. Um, they also have a quiz if you do want to drill your staff on cold chain management. In terms of what I refer patients to, so generally speaking for parents, I will refer them to the Melbourne Vaccine Education Centre, which is a collaboration between the Royal Children's Hospital and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Their website is very good, well-researched, really good resources, plain English, not difficult, um, quite easily accessible and it covers everything. It's not just flu vaccinations, it's everything about vaccines. Well, good, well worth a little read. Um, they also have some really good education as well. So I would say jump on there and have a little bit of a look. If patients are wanting something that's a little bit heftier, I generally refer them to the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. So they do a lot of um, work around safety monitoring um, and feeding back to the TGA. Their resources are super comprehensive. So probably not great starting point for someone who English isn't their first language. It can get quite scientific. Um, but I think for pa those patients that do want a little bit more than just basic information, it is a good place to go. Ausvac safety, so they are part of the NCIRS. So those of you that have been having smart vacs on your systems that are sending out um, post-vaccine follow-ups, this is where all that data is collated. They have some really fantastic infographics that you can print and display and use as a reference point for discussing side effects with parents. It's amazing, they do wonderful work. The last one I popped on there is the Immunisation Coalition. Um, again, really basic resources for patients, but some really fantastic resources. And again, some really great conferences and education that they run for health professionals. So that's it for me. So if you've got any questions, go for it. What I can suggest is for anyone, if they have questions, they can uh, feel free to either unmute themselves and ask the questions, or they can pop it through uh, the chat to us. So please feel free to ask any questions, should you have any. So I do feel that the um, presentation was very well laid out and very elaborate. So thank you very much for that, Natalie. Really do appreciate that. I did have a few questions in mind, but you did answer them as you went along. Especially my son is allergic to egg. And I was mm. wondering whether <laughs> that would mean he can't have one of those vaccines. Um, so I wonder if you can see the question from Irma, um, who's asking, thank you, Irma. Uh, the question that Irma has just put in chat is, uh, whether they are able to have the handouts or a condensed version of the handouts. So, um, Natalie, it's up to yeah, you whether absolutely. you want to provide a condensed version and a absolutely. PDF form. Yeah, um, not a problem. You can email it to me and then um, what I can do tomorrow as part of the um, 
uh, the post session email that we send out is that we um, I can attach it to that and send it out. Um, what we will also do as part of our um, all webinars and sessions is that we will put in a little evaluation um, link in the in the chat now. We will pop it in for you guys. And I will request um, for kindly all of you to complete that survey. It'll literally take a few minutes. Um, completing that evaluation helps um, us to um, better, better prepare webinars and sessions for you, better quality webinars and sessions. Um, Phil is shaking his head, so I don't know whether Phil cannot find it. Let me have a look for you, just bear with me. Otherwise, I can send it out with the four session webinar tomorrow. Four session webinar email. Okay. All right. So I will put. I'll pop it in for you guys in the in the chat here. Just bear with me. Chat. Okay. So. Here's the link to the evaluation survey. If you can please kindly complete it, that'll be much appreciated. And I will also pop it in the email that I will send out tomorrow. Um, we still have a few moments. So if you guys have any questions, please do feel free to ask. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, Lee, the recording, all our webinars are recorded. And what we do is that uh, once the recording is available, um, they are then, um, A, it is emailed to everyone who registered for the session. Um, and secondly, that all of our uh, recordings go on our website under our uh, resource library, as well as on our YouTube channel. And they're available there for a while. So certainly, yes, um, the recording is very much available. We have a wonderful resource library and we hope that moving forward, we can turn that into a little, um, some type of practice coach or uh, for mentoring practice managers and practice nurses. So hopefully um, that will be a useful resource moving forward. Not a problem. I do notice that there's a few uh, wonderful participants in the um, in the session today uh, who I could not identify. Um, they have joined just with um, a, a couple of initials. Um, if they can please either email me or um, or email the education um, email address um, or email or chat to us uh, with their first and last name so we can identify them. Um, I have a question from Lisa. Um, Natalie, and I'll read the question out. Um, so Lisa is asking, is a seven day interval still preferred between influenza and COVID vaccine um, or either is okay? So no need to wait the full week. Um, so you can do it same day. You don't have to wait a week. Um, I think the one thing to put into consideration, particularly if they're 65 and over and we're looking at a fourth booster, um, just in terms of side effects. So we know when we give them co-committantly, there's no increase um, in either severity or duration of side effects. Um, but sort of explaining to people that, you know, you might want to wait a week in between vaccines. So you get over one round of side effects before you do the next one. Um, I, that's generally why I encourage them to get it on the same day. You just do one round of side effects and then you're done. I would like to get both of them done together and be over and done with it. <laughs> Take a day or two of work and maybe, you know, do it on the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, stay in bed and Monday get back to work. <laughs> or Monday and have Tuesday, Wednesday off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's better, you know, stay in bed the weekend so uh, the kids leave me alone or, you know, do it on the Monday, Tuesday so I don't have to go to work. <laughs> Not too sure. <laughs> Both the options are quite, Both, you know, enticing. All have merits. All options have merits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly do, certainly do. All right, excellent. 
Um, I was wondering whether having the COVID vaccine would in some way, you know, impart, um, and this is a really silly question, but I was just thinking, you know, given that it is a type of a um, flu type of virus, whether that were having the COVID vaccine, whether, you know, people would think that having the COVID vaccine impart some type of uh, protection against the flu vaccine or, you know, it, it, and whether the general or, or people who are, I don't know, um, averse to having vaccination in general would think, oh, I've had the COVID vaccine, so maybe I shouldn't have the flu vaccine, or if I've had the flu vaccine, you know, maybe I should not have the COVID vaccine. I don't know. Um, so, I, and I see your question, Irma, I'll answer it in a second. Um, <laughs> so it is something, and I, I think there's a lot of that cohort that maybe weren't anti-vaccination prior to or vaccine hesitant um, yeah. prior to COVID, but through reasons not related to health, um, are feeling a little less vaccine keen. Um, and so, you know, we, we find this cohort that have had two COVID vaccines and haven't had a booster. Um, it, it, there is, and there is a degree of misinformation, you know, health literacy in Absolutely. this country varies. Even looking at the Northwest Melbourne PHN catchment, you know, we have areas of really high literacy, health literacy down in Yarra, um, to areas where we have a lot of people who are really newly arrived to Australia and maybe Absolutely. haven't had a, you know, good experience with vaccines in the past or have been in really difficult circumstances where immunisation is the least of your priority. So, Absolutely. you know, we need to be making sure that our messaging is consistent um, it's actually targeted to the level that people's understanding is. But yeah, there is certainly some inf misinformation around. I think a lot of people go, well, I'm protected against COVID. You know, that'll that'll provide me some coverage for flu or, well, you know, COVID's worse. Flu's not that bad. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, it's, it is going to be a really challenging year. Um, in terms of Irma's question, so if the patient is under nine, and they had a flu shot the previous year, do they need two doses this year? No, they don't. So that second dose in the first year is for that first year's protection. So if they have one in the first year and not the second, it just means that they have reduced protection in that first year. Every year after that, it's one regardless. You're welcome, Emma. And thank you for interacting with us and asking questions. Their information, I'm sure, is useful to everyone. Nice to know people aren't sick of my voice after that hour. <laughs> Certainly not. Well, oh, look. Thank you for spending your evenings talking about work. <laughs> So Natalie, is your practice all prepared and stock is being ordered or ordered? Yes. Or? Yeah, no, I um, I have been refreshing the one link madly um, and was hoping to beat them before they sent out the email to say <laughs> that it was online. And then we all had the fun of they sent out the email, but the website wasn't ready. So then they sent out another email to say the website's not ready. And then they sent another one to say the website's now ready. So I ordered last Friday. Um, and my vaccines arrived yesterday. So we've got our first 60 patients booked in on Friday afternoon. So oh, wow. it's Did just you, like yeah. COVID <laughs> all over again, which is very but, exciting, but I'm really pleased that we still have a, a big cohort of patients that are excited to come in and have their flu shots, which is really good. So I think trying to discuss their fourth booster with them may be a challenge, but we will, we will have that conversation as it applies. We'll see how absolutely. we go. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure that um, your patients will hopefully listen to you. You know, um, you've been very convincing in the past, so I'm sure that you know they will listen to good. My things. vaccine rates are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am lucky in that I work in the inner part of our catchment area as well, so slightly <sighs> easier um, to convince people, which is nice. Excellent. That is fantastic. Awesome. Um, I will uh, make one last call for any further questions and um, look, we can keep the conversation flowing offline as well. Um, if there are no further questions for now, um, and if you do come up with any further questions, you can always email them to us um, at the education email address, which is um, education at Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network um, org. 
Got a U, is that correct, Bill? Please back me up on this one. It's too late in the night for me, sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, I will be sending a post session email tomorrow and you guys can all respond to that if you have any questions and I'm more than happy to forward them to Natalie as we go. Um, so Carmen has just, I have Carmen who's just messaged me directly and she's thanking you for a very thorough and informative presentation, Natalie. My so pleasure. Carmen, thank you very much for joining us and attending and thank you very much for appreciating the presentation. Um, and once again, uh, thank you all in advance for completing that survey and have a lovely night and um, we will send out some resources, uh, the links to the resources and the web links in tomorrow's email. And once I have a condensed version of Natalie's slides, I will forward that in an email as well. So thank you all and have a great night. Thank you. Bye.